G'day everyone, Ben the Spider Seeker here. Today I'll be talking about possibly one of the most misunderstood spiders in Australia. Between rumours, unreliable evidence, inaccurate research and wives' tales, the Lamponidae family, being the white tail spiders, is to some probably one of the most feared spiders in Australia. To others, it, it's, it's not. In terms of their identification, there's a few similar families and it can be difficult to tell them apart from other spiders. For a start though, not everything with a white tail is a white tail spider. <laughs> he, he doesn't get the joke. Uh, the most common species of Lamponidae are the Lampona species, the classic white tail with an elongated abdomen and two pairs of legs very strongly oriented forward and a narrow carapace. The front two pairs of legs are also often thicker than the others, but that can vary a little bit. The white tail spider sometimes goes by the name white tip, which again, it can sometimes be a little misleading. And she doesn't like the joke either, so I guess I'll guess I'll just stop now. They do look a bit similar to Nafosidae, where all the ground spiders, since they share a relatively close evolutionary history and can sometimes be very difficult to tell apart. This one though, because it's a bit smaller and younger, it doesn't look quite as elongated as the Lamponidae species. White tails for the most part are fairly dark in colour with a small white tip on the end of the abdomen. Uh, the juveniles though can be fairly strongly patterned with a lot more white and some banding on the legs. These spiders are a largely nocturnal wandering hunter. During the day they will build a small sack like shelter to hide in, usually in a small space like folds in linen, clothing or curtains. They're kind of their favourite places to hide out. They're also very proficient at their hunting, with a particular aptitude for taking on web-building spiders, like redbacks, blackhouse spiders, and sometimes even daddy longlegs or cellar spiders. It's not always the case, though, that the white tail wins the fight, and can just as easily end up on the menu for the other spiders that it's trying to attack. Alright, now it's time to check out some of the myths surrounding this spider, and where some of them came from. And of course, we're going to smash those myths with some science. The first myth is the big one, that these spiders are deadly, or they cause ulcers and necrosis. Now, necrotic wound is basically a horrific injury where the cells around the initial wound start dying. I'm not going to show any pictures of those because they're fairly gross. The myth itself started back in the 1980s, with an article published stating that there may be some connection between whitetails and ulcerated or necrotic wounds, similar to those from the brown recluse spider. It's worth noting though that when a scientific article uses the term maybe, that usually means there's not actually any solid evidence yet, but it could be worth investigating. Throughout the 90s there were a few studies done that base their evidence on word of mouth, unconfirmed bites, and accounts from doctors who base their diagnoses on the may be a link evidence previously mentioned. These articles, since they asked for essentially stories about whitetail spider bites, unfortunately got exactly that, stories. The articles did have a few confirmed bites and the identity of the spider was confirmed. But in the cases that were presented with those, the symptoms were only minor the cases of necrotic or ulcerated wounds usually showed evidence of bacterial infection like staphylococcus or something horrible like that, but were not really associated with any bites of any kind in most cases. After nearly 20 years of rumours and unreliable evidence, two articles were published in 2002 and 2003 respectively, studying only confirmed bites with confirmed identifications. Both of these are linked in the description. The first study in 2002 looked at 750 confirmed spider bites of different spiders around Australia. It included white tails. The conclusion was that other than Loxicelli species being the recluse spider, which has an introduced population near Adelaide, no spider bites resulted in necrotic wounds or ulcers and that other causes should probably be sought out. The second study only focused on bites from whitetail spiders, studying 130 confirmed bites with a confirmed identification. This study concluded that whitetail spider bites in the majority only caused minor effects, 
sometimes as bad as a headache and nausea, but are very unlikely to be the cause of necrotic or ulcerated wounds. So, looking at the evidence, and getting scientific with this myth, we can give it the status of, well, rubbish. There are many causes of ulcers and necrotic wounds. Immediately blaming a spider bite might mean that proper investigation into the actual cause isn't done. And that could lead to our next myth. Myth number two, recurring wounds. Now, I've heard this one a few times. Stories about someone who's been bitten by a whitetail, had this horrific injury that we've already discussed, and then a few months later it comes back. Or, rather superstitiously, it comes back every 12 months. Now, unfortunately for this one, I haven't been able to track down where the myth began. There's not really any mention of it occurring in any of the related research I've found either. In fact, the only similarity I've found is that of cold sores and a few bacterial infections. Now, viral infections that cause cold sores are able to persist in a kind of dormant state in the body and flare up every now and then. The bacterial infections, this can sort of happen too, but another possible reason for it is the antibiotic treatment might have been ineffective or not substantial enough. Other than that, there's no actual structure in the venom of a whitetail spider that's able to replicate these effects, especially since the venom is filtered out of the blood relatively quickly. So, lacking evidence and having no known method from a biological standpoint, this myth might as well be classed as, well, rubbish. So we've had two rubbish myths, and now on to our third myth. That it's able to absorb and use the venom from other spiders that it eats. The way venom works does not actually allow it to be absorbed through the digestive system. In most cases, the venom is actually destroyed by the digestive system. There's only a few animals in the world capable of absorbing the toxins from other animals, and in these cases, it's invariably poison rather than venom. Now, poisons can be eaten or injected. Venoms, though, have to be injected to have an effect. Since they're denatured by the digestive process, they have to bypass it. The ability to absorb and use another spider's venom is also completely unheard of. Even if it was, the spider would be no more venomous than the other spider that it ate, so realistically this myth doesn't serve any purpose. So again, with a lack of evidence or any cases where it does happen, it makes this myth as well rubbish. Now on to the danger rating. It really almost feels unnecessary, but hey, Venom, that's a 2 out of 10. Despite being cleared of the ferocious reputation, the venom can apparently cause anything from minor irritation or a dull pain at the bite site to a stronger pain accompanied by headache and nausea. For defensiveness, I've given it a 1 out of 10. These spiders really, their first defense is to run. They rarely threaten when they're confronted. Risk of contact though, that's a 9 out of 10. These are a very common spider, and they're an active hunter, meaning they'll often wander into homes. And their habit of hiding in curtains or beds or linen during the day, that makes them fairly easy to contact. The distance to help though, I've rated that as 0 out of 10. The spider itself isn't considered medically significant, so getting to the hospital is probably not necessary. If you are bitten though, and you've got any concerns about it, by all means, seek medical help. In fact, I would recommend doing so if you're ever concerned about a bite. Overall, a solid 3 out of 10, with a danger rating of harmless. Well, edit, mostly harmless. Generally, this spider is condemned unreasonably, and it's feared much more than can be rationalised. Realistically, for the most part, this spider is far from dangerous, and it actually preys on other spiders around the house, which could be considered medically significant. Anyway, thanks for watching everyone. Feel free to like, share, subscribe, all the usual stuff if you're keen. For now though, I've been Ben the Spider Seeker, and you've been great. Catch you next time.